And uh, the next speaker is Antoine Mallard. Yeah, so Hi. he's coming to us from, from ENS, and uh, he'll tell us about uh, landscape complexity for the empirical risk of generalized linear models. Okay, cool. So yes, I'm going to talk today about the, some recent work with uh, Gérard Benarous and Giulio Viroli on the landscape complexity of the empirical risk for, for generalized linear models. So, of course, analyzing this landscape is interesting because it has a lot of consequences for the behavior of local optimization algorithms, such as gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent. And uh, interestingly, in many, in many statistical problems of this kind, uh, there has been a lot of work to, to prove that there exists a regime in which the optimization landscape is easy. Uh, by easy, I mean that there are no sp uh, spurious local minima. However, all, uh, many of these algorithms often work far beyond these uh, this provable regimes. And so basically you can imagine two reasons for that. The first one is that the, the, the bounds I just mentioned are not tight enough and actually the landscape is easy far beyond these bounds. Another possibility, which is a bit more interesting maybe, is that the, the optimization algorithms can work even when the, the landscape has many spurious local minima. This is what I call the hard regime. And if you, if you believe that this uh, second possibility can happen, then it's, it's, it's actually very interesting to try to understand the topological transition in the landscape, meaning can you understand when do many spurious local minima appear and how they appear. So for, for, for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to focus on, on two models. The first one is some kind of uh, perceptron uh, energy in the statistical physics language. So it's basically just uh, one node in our network, so very, very simple, with the weight vector which are normalized. And the, the, the loss function, it's not really a loss, but in this case, I'm going to call it a, a loss, is actually just the sum of an activation function uh, applied to the projection of uh, the data on the weight vector. And the, the second function is a bit more interesting because it corresponds to a real statistical estimation problem. It's uh, basically the squared loss of a generalized linear model. So it's, it's a teacher-student setup of the, of, the previous, uh, of the previous network in which now you try to recover the weights of the teacher by minimizing the, this loss. And in both cases, I'm going to assume that the data is actually IID Gaussian and that I'm going to look at, the, at these two problems in a high dimensional limit in which uh, both the, the dimension of the data and the number of samples go to infinity at uh, the same rate, basically. And so this is a classical setup, in, especially in the statistical physics analysis of, this, of these problems. And the, okay, so the, the precise question we are interested in is, can we count the number of critical points of these uh, functions of L1 and L2 uh, with a definite loss value and a definite overlap in the case of L2 between X and X star? So the overlap is just the scalar product. It basically gives you the distance on the hypersphere between these two points. So, okay, so this, is, so this is actually the number that we are trying to compute, this uh, crit star of B and Q. This is just the number of critical points of L2 with loss, uh, so L2, loss value in the set B and overlap in the set Q. So as a function of the two sets B and Q, I have this number. So note that this is actually uh, a random variable because the data is random. And from the statistical physics analysis of these problems, we, we expect that this number is actually going to be exponentially large. So since it's exponentially large, you have to be careful in your analysis and analysis that the, in, in particular, this is not going to be well described by the mean, by the expected value. So again, in the, in the statistical physics language, this is what we call annealed and quenched uh, quantities. So I'm gonna define the, the annealed complexity, which is just going to be the, the limit of the log of the expectation of, of, this, uh, of this variable, of the number of critical points. But since this variable is typically of exponential size, the, more, the most interesting value is the quenched complexity, which is the limit of the expectation of the log. So, and in general, these two quantities are very different. The annealed one is usually easier to compute uh, and can already give you bounds on the quenched complexity, but the real typical value is given by the quenched one. So before presenting our, our result, let me just uh, give a brief uh, introduction to the main tool that we are going to use to, to count this number of critical points, which is called the, the catch rise formula. So it's based on a, on a very simple intuition that is for, uh, for a one dimensional function, uh, 
uh, you would like uh, heuristically to write that the, its number of zeros is actually equal to this integral, right? So if f is not a diffeomorphism, this is not true, but you, you kind of want to write a formula like this. And the, the catch rate formula actually makes this intuition precise in the sense that it allows you to count precisely the, so for instance, the first moment of the number of critical points of a random function of n variables. As a, so this is the first moment as an integral over all the, the possible values of x of the parameter of the first term, which is basically related to the density of the gradient of f, because f is a random function, so its gradient is also random. So it has a density, and this is related to the density. But the most interesting part is actually the second term, which is actually a term that depends on the determinant of the Hessian. So actually, the Hessian of f is a, is a random matrix, because f is random. And you can see that fundamentally, the Catrice formula transforms this, this problem of counting critical points into a random matrix theory problem. And you can actually improve over this formula uh, to fix uh, the value of f, for instance, or to get higher order moments of the number of critical points. But as I said, because you need to be able to study the hash chain in a random matrix theory, uh, with random matrix theory, in general, for generic random functions, this is not doable. And this is why so far, both in the mathematics and the physics literature, uh, the huge majority of, of works are focused on the, focused on the Gaussian random functions, meaning that for all points, f of x is a Gaussian random variable. And uh, the most simple example for this is the so-called pure p-spin in, in statistical physics. So this is a very old model. And uh, there has been a lot of improvements about this model, but the, the, the baseline is that in all this, uh, this uh, previous analysis, the function is always, is always Gaussian. You can introduce correlations and so on, but it's always Gaussian. Um, so here, let, let me now jump to our, to our result. So our main result is actually a first exact result. So it's not a, it's not a bound, it's really an exact result using this catrace formula in the case where the, the random function is not Gaussian. So because the functions L1 and L2 I presented before are non-Gaussian, of course. These are the, for instance, the square loss is not a Gaussian random function. And the, so this is how it reads. So for instance, this is the annealed complexity of N1. So this is the simplest of the, of the possible results. And uh, it is given by a constant term plus a supremum of a set of probability measures. So it's actually a variational problem, which involves uh, three terms. The first one is some simple linear statistics. The second one is some relative entropy term with respect to the Gaussian measure. And the last one is actually a, a very involved term that you can compute analytically, but which, on which is related to the asymptotic spectral measure of Z, D, Z transpose, some kind of um, sample covariance matrix. If Z is the IID Gaussian matrix and D is a matrix that is taking a, a diagonal, which is taking basically IID from the, the measure new. So we also have a similar result, which is a bit more uh, involved to write. So I don't write it in here in full for the case of L2. So for the squared loss of the, of the general linear model. And uh, as I mentioned, because this function kappa alpha is, uh, is very involved in general, apart from some trivial cases, it's impossible, uh, as far as we know, to solve this problem analytically. So, however, we, we, are, we also derived some heuristic uh, calculations to simplify the, the, the expression of this function, which are based on the, on the works of Marchenko and Pasteur, especially. And uh, this leads to simpler scalar fixed point equations. So instead of the supremum of a probability measure, we, we have now a, an extremization problem over a finite number of scalar variables. And this can be now numerically solved, but this is an ongoing work. I'm not going to present the, the numerical curves uh, so, so far. So before concluding, let me give you a, a brief overview of, of the proof. Because as I said, we need to study the Hessian condition by the gradient being zero. And uh, the main idea behind our, our technique is to say that we are going to condition everything in the problem by the random variables that are given by the projection of the data on the weight vector. Since the nonlinearity only depends on these variables, actually you can see that once you condition over them, the, the conditional distribution of the Hessian is tractable this time and up to some uh, finite rank uh, and the uh, uh, identity term, it's given by some kind of a generalized version of a sample covariance matrix. 
So it's just generalized because it's not necessarily a positive matrix. So it's not really a sample covariance matrix, but it's really close. And uh, now using this, uh, this characterization, we are able to prove uh, some concentration properties of the determinant of the Hessian that we, as I said, we need to compute this in the catchphrase trace formula. And, uh, and we are able to say that this, uh, this uh, quantity, this determinant only depends on the empirical distribution of these uh, Y variables. So this is the empirical distribution. There are N variables and M goes to infinity. And uh, now we can use a very classical results in, uh, in, in a large deviation theory, which is the sign of theorem that, uh, that says that the, the, the empirical distribution satisfies large deviations properties with a weight function, which is given by the relative entropy with respect to the Gaussian measure. And then you can see that uh, using these large deviations, so in the space of probability measures, uh, and using Varadon's lemma, you, we obtain the, the result for the complexity as a supremum over, over the set of probability measures, because we applied Varadon's lemma of uh, the terms that depended on the determinant of the Hessian, another term that accounts for the other terms in the, in the catch rise formula. And the last term is, is the relative entropy, because this is a rate function of the, of the large deviations. So you, you, you can al already see why we obtain a result in this form as a supremum of uh, probability measures with a, rate, with a relative entropy term. And uh, let me now conclude by first stating two additional results that we have in the, in the paper. The first one is uh, for reasons of time, I didn't describe here, but we also have a closed formula for the quench complexity. As I mentioned, this is the typical value, so it's the most interesting one, but actually uh, our derivation for the quench complexity is not rigorous, it's, it's not rigorous uh, as opposed to the annealed one, because it's based on the, on the replica method from statistical physics which implies which, uh, that we must compute higher order moments of the complexity. But then going to the quench complexity is a non-rigorous trick, so we cannot really state this as a theorem. And uh, we also generalize the results to some uh, other models. Generalizing this uh, to neural networks with more than one uh, node is actually something that we are not able to do at the moment. So, but this is uh, an interesting open question. And uh, let me uh, uh, really conclude by giving uh, two future directions. The first one is, uh, of course, the most obvious one, that is getting numerical curves of the topological transition in the landscape uh, for different activation functions. As I mentioned, this is, uh, this is ongoing work. And the second one is, you may have noticed that so far, I have only mentioned counting the total number of critical points, but for a local optimization uh, perspective, you really care about counting local minima. And uh, from the catch choice formula, we know that uh, to be able to count local minima, we need to understand the large deviations of the lowest eigenvalue of the Hessian. And here the Hessian is a complicated random matrix. So it's, it's, a, it's actually, an, it was actually an open problem in random matrix theory to, to obtain these large deviations. But this is something that we believe we, we can do using uh, some recent uh, techniques in large deviations. And uh, this uh, is an ongoing work that should uh, hopefully appear soon. And uh, with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. I have a question before I ask you to address if there's any on the Q and A, which is can you can you can you find an actual like an interesting uh, you know fundamentally looking example where you can actually optimize uh, when the, the the landscape starts being very rough? I mean the the I think an interesting example no, that gets that. where the roughness I guess gets predicted by your uh, by your theorem. Yeah, exactly. The roughness is predicted by this, but uh, I mean, we already know on the, squ on the squared loss, and I think it is, uh, for instance, I mean, the first example that comes to mind is, is phase retrieval. And uh, so this is just the quadratic activation function. And in this case, I think there's, I mean, there is a recent work by people in our, in, in, in our group, ETNS, on the, the analyzing the stochastic gradient descent in this problem. And I think, yeah, and I think they find, for instance, that you need uh, that the, the landscape is, uh, I mean, from the point of view of local optimization, the landscape is rough up until alpha diverging as log n. So, for instance, in this problem, we would, we would expect for, that for, for all uh, alpha, finite alpha, we would have uh, roughness in the landscape. Uh, then you have other problems, and maybe this is related a little bit to the question in the Q&A. So maybe I can comment on that. As yeah, well. if you could, uh, if you could comment on that, that would be great. Yeah. I mean, the, the question was asking about 
can we say something more about the nature of the critical points that we are counting? And so, as I mentioned, the, the, having a definite answer for, uh, for this from the catch-wise computation is hard, but because you need to understand large deviations of, the, of each eigenvalues, for instance, if you want to compute saddle points of index one, you need to understand large deviations for the first, I mean, for the second eigenvalue, and uh, for the second lowest. And uh, for the local minima, you need the lowest. And uh, as I mentioned, for the lowest eigenvalue, this is a result that hopefully would soon be available. But uh, so far, it, it is not. But however, there are two maybe interesting uh, intuitions that, the, that would say, I mean, that would indicate that at the bottom of the landscape, so close to the global minimum, the local minima should actually dominate all the complexity because uh, you have you, you can you can do two analogies for that i mean the first one is so sorry the first you have two arguments for that the first one is an analogy with the gaussian models in gaussian models when you have a signal this is what actually happens and uh, the second one is you have some very interesting work uh, from the physics uh, perspective which accounts the numbers of solution of the so-called tap uh, equations and uh, this actually, you have some heuristic calculations of this based on the replica method, which predict as well that you have an exponentially large number of, uh, of the local minima of the tap free energy uh, close to the global minimum, and that, the, that close to the global minimum, this local minima dominate all the complexity. So again, so to, to come back to the question of Fonzo, again, this is something using this uh, these uh, uh, so-called Monasson calculations would also give some kind of intuition of when the landscape should be rough or not. Of course, it's describing not the real landscape, but the tap landscape, but since it should already give some intuition. Yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah, thanks.